All right. Hello and welcome. Max Mathias here. So uh, today we're going to be talking about market equilibrium. So I like to think of this as kind of the culmination of our demand and supply uh, series. We're bringing them together. Before we get started, I highly recommend that you watch those individual videos. Uh, they will basically give you everything you need uh, to be able to talk about what we're going to talk about here, jargon, you know, talking about shifts, things like that. Uh, but again, you don't have to, but uh, highly recommend it. So what is a market, right? Well, it's basically a place to facilitate an exchange of goods and or services. This can actually be like an actual place, like a literal marketplace, right? Where you're going around buying and selling particular things. Although obviously now uh, online markets are more and more becoming the norm, but basically it is a place, whether actual or virtual, where uh, people are able to exchange goods and services. A market is defined by the good or service itself, right? So let's say like apples, those who want to purchase it, consumers, right, which is basically synonymous with demand in these uh, examples, and then those who wish to sell it, right, so which are producers, synonymous with supply. So you need those three elements to have a market. You need a good or service, people who want to buy it, people who want to sell it. That's it. For now, let's assume that we have a large amount of both buyers and sellers, right, right? Um, you know, I, I'm sure I'll make videos on this later and stuff, but there's a lot of interesting things happen when there are a small amount of sellers or just one seller or a small amount of buyers or just one buyer, right? Those are particular cases that we want to uh, take into account. Right now, we're just going to assume we have a lot of both. We're also going to assume that relevant information about the good or service is known. So what do I mean by this? Um, the idea, right, is that if you go into a store, you don't necessarily know about, you know, the quality of a particular uh, thing you're buying, you know, whether it's well-made, whatever, we're assuming all of that away for right now, right? And the big reason that I kind of think about this is sometimes if you say go into a store and you see something that's cheap, right, you assume immediately that it's, you know, cheaply made, right? It's not a good quality. Um, it's hard to you really kind of know that, right? Am I getting a good deal or is this just kind of a crap product? Uh, for right now, we're going to ignore that, right? So basically, you know, uh, exactly, you know, what you need to know about the good. I know it's kind of a weird thing to start with these assumptions, but uh, the idea is to try and get away uh, from some of those, you know, very natural kind of instincts we have interacting with the world around us of, you know, sometimes if something is a lower price than we think it should be, we kind of second guess and go, well, what's wrong with it, right? Here, we're not worrying about that. So let's get away, uh, started and draw a market immediately. So we have our axes, right? We have our price and our quantity axis, and then we're going to draw our generic demand curve, downward sloping, and our generic supply curve, upward sloping, right? So this is our starting point. And what we really want to do is focus on where supply and demand intersect that point right there. What makes that point so special is that at that particular price, quantity demanded equals quantity supplied, right? If you looked at any other price, they would not be the same. But at that particular point, they're equal to each other. What that means in words is that at that price, people are willing to buy exactly as much as people are willing to sell, right? So basically, a hundred, you know, people are willing to sell, say, hundred units of this thing. That's exactly how much people are willing to buy. We say the market then clears, right? There's nothing left over, and everyone who wanted to buy something gets what they want. So that is going to be our focus. That point right there, we call our equilibrium price, right? That is the special price where quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. And then the associated quantity that is ultimately bought and sold, we call equilibrium quantity. So I uh, label these with a P star and Q star. You may have other instructors do it differently. I don't want you to get super caught up on notation, uh, but this is what I use, right? So really, this is what we care about. At this point, where supply and demand intersect, boom, quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. That's our equilibrium price and our equilibrium quantity. Well, why is it in equilibrium? Well, if we start from the graph on the last slide here, imagine for some reason if there was some price higher up there, right? So if basically price for some reason was above P star, what would happen? Well, at that particular price, Quantity demanded is that point right there, right? I'm just looking on the demand curve at that price, while quantity supplied is over here, right? Which one is bigger? Quantity supplied, right? So quantity supplied exceeds quantity demanded. We call this a surplus, right? So the idea is at this high price, there are more people who are willing to sell the good 
then there are people who are willing to buy it. So as you as a seller are going to be like, man, no one wants to buy it anymore. And I'm left with all of this kind of excess stuff that I want to sell. So if you wanted to be able to sell all of that excess stuff, what would you have to do? And my intuition probably says that you're saying you got to lower the price. And that's exactly right. So when you have this surplus that creates what we call a downward pressure, right? People want to get rid of that excess quantity supplied and it's going to bring us a pressure back to P star, right? For any price above P star, more people want to sell it than people want to buy it. They got to lower the price to get us back to P star where those numbers exactly equal each other again. What about if price was below P star? So starting from here again, let's say our price was low. At this point, moving from left to right, quantity supplied is now there, right? And again, I'm just looking on the supply curve, while quantity demanded is over there. What do you notice about them? Quantity demanded is larger than quantity supplied, so that is more people want to buy the good at this low price than people are willing to sell. That's called a shortage, right? There are all of these people who want to buy it because the good we can say was artificially, right? The price was artificially low and not that many people want to sell. So you have all of these people who want to buy it that basically weren't able to buy one, right? Because not enough was supplied to the market. So if you put yourself in the mind of a seller, you have all of these people who still want to buy the good. What should you do? Again, my intuition probably says you're thinking about raising the price. and That's exactly right. That creates an upward pressure on price, ultimately is going to lead us back to P star. So the thing that basically makes equilibrium special is once we're there, we have no reason to change, right? There's no reason for a price to go up or down, but if for some crazy reason it did, we'd always get back there, right? If price is too high, we have a surplus, price goes down. If price is too low, we have a shortage, price goes back up. So once we're there, we have no reason to leave. And if for some reason we did leave, we're going to get back there. So that's the idea. Now, what we're really interested in these uh, graphs, though, is where we want to know how these equilibrium prices, P star and Q star, react to changes to demand and supply, right? So starting with this graph right here, I think it's interesting enough, but it's kind of static, right? Nothing's really happening. But what if I throw a kind of wrench in the system? So what if demand increases? So we have this rightward shift of demand. I want to know, well, how does the market react to this change, right? Well, if the price stayed at the original blue P star, if we look at our supply curve and then our demand curve, well, oops, we'd have a shortage, right? If price stayed at that exact same point, right? We're looking at the new green demand. Well, we just talked about this. When there's a shortage, what happens? Creates that upward price pressure. Price is going to go up and we're going to hit what we call a new equilibrium here, the green P star and Q star. Now, I kind of talked about the process of getting us from the blue to the green uh, equilibriums. If you're doing this in class or anything like that, you don't have to draw that thing of, you know, oh, shortage, price goes up. We can just assume, boom, it happens kind of instantaneously, but I want to give you an idea, kind of the intuition of what's happening there. So in looking at that blue equilibrium to the green equilibrium, what happened to price and what happened to quantity? Well, equilibrium price, P star went up, so did equilibrium quantity Q star. Now, what if demand decreased? So I am not going to draw a different graph here. What I'm going to ask is for you to use your imagination. Imagine the green line was our starting point and the blue line was our ending point, right? So we took that green demand curve and we shifted it to the left. Going from the green to the blue, well, price went down, quantity went down too. So in one graph, we've basically covered the shifts to make your life a little bit easier, here's a little cheat sheet for you. If demand increases for any reason, right, equilibrium price will go up, equilibrium quantity will go up. If on the other hand, demand decreases for some reason, equilibrium price goes down, equilibrium quantity goes down as well, right? That will, you know, 99 times out of 100 be the case, okay? So that was demand shifts. Let's talk about supply shifts. So. We're going to start with our point here. We have our market in equilibrium again. We're going to draw our increase in supply, right? That rightward shift. Again, if price wanted to stay at that original blue P star, what would happen? Well, we'd have a surplus 
We know from a surplus that creates that downward pressure on price, and we'd move lower, right? We'd move to the green equilibrium there. So what do you notice about the relationship of P star and Q star at the green equilibrium relative to the blue one? Well, equilibrium price decreased, equilibrium quantity increased. Now, what about if supply decreased? We're gonna do the same thought experiment. Imagine the green supply curve was our starting point and it shifted to the left to blue. What would happen? Equilibrium price increases, equilibrium quantity decreases. So we have a cheat sheet here as well. When supply increases, you're going to see equilibrium price fall and equilibrium quantity increase. And when supply decreases, equilibrium price goes up equilibrium quantity goes down, okay? So we have these four kind of possible shifts. Demand going up or down, supply going up or down. So we've talked about demand shifts, we've talked about supply shifts in isolation. What if both supply and demand are changing at the same time? So we have our starting point here, and by the way, I highly recommend if you are in a principles of micro class or you wanna do econ, get used to this graph. Uh, I honestly have probably drawn I mean, I feel like I'm exaggerating, but maybe not like close to a million of these in my time uh, as an economist. So this is a really good graph to kind of get the hang of. This is your starting point for so much of principles of micro. But let's say both demand and supply increase, right? So we're looking at now where the green lines intersect. And what do you notice? Well, the way I've drawn it is it looks like maybe P star increases by a little bit and Q star goes up too, right? But what if I drew shifts that looked like this, right? So if I had a small increase in demand and a big increase in supply, while well now looking at where the green lines intersect, P star has gone down while Q star has gone up, right? So are we wrong in the first case? Well, the answer is no, right? So what's the solution here? Well, let's use our handy dandy cheat sheet. When demand goes up, we know P star goes up as does Q star. And when supply goes up, P star goes down and Q star goes up. So what I want you to do is look at the arrows, right? The P star arrows are facing in different directions while the Q star arrows are pointing in the same direction. So from that, we know that the effect on P star, we say that it's ambiguous, right? It really depends on which shift is bigger. Without additional information, I don't know. Right, so the correct answer is, well, it's ambiguous, right? The increase in supply wants price to go down, while the increase in demand wants price to go up. So ultimately, I don't know what the change in price will be, but those Q star arrows are both, both pointing up. I know Q star is increasing 100%. So using this little cheat sheet here, you can use it for all the possible combinations of supply and demand shifts. Let's do another one quickly. So let's have demand decrease while supply increases as well. So to quickly draw that, a red shift to the left of demand and a green shift to the right of supply. So let's not even worry about what we think. I mean, if I was to try and guess, price goes down and maybe quantity is the same, but let's just use our cheat sheet right away. When demand falls, I know equilibrium price falls and equilibrium quantity falls. And when supply increases, equilibrium price falls, equilibrium quantity increases. Again, we match our arrows. Both P star arrows are going down, so I know price is going down for sure. The quantity arrows, though, are going in opposite directions. So what's the answer here? Well, P star, we know equilibrium price for sure decreased. Equilibrium quantity is ambiguous, right? You got to give me more information to do it. Most of the time in these classes, they won't specify, hey, the supply shift was big while the demand shift was small. If they do, use the cheat sheet as well, right? Whichever one is bigger ultimately would determine the effect on quantity here, right? But if you don't give me that information, that's why we say it's ambiguous. So I'm usually honestly not a big fan of telling people to memorize things, but if you memorize those four simple lines on the cheat sheet about supply uh, increase and decrease and demand increase and decrease, you'll always get these ambiguity questions right. So with that, let's do a very quick recap here. Uh, always start these problems with a market in equilibrium, right? So that blue line, that graph I showed you, make sure your axes are labeled, make sure your curves are labeled, 
labeled to equilibrium too. I'm a stickler, but it's good practice to get into. Remember, it's called an equilibrium because if there are not any changes, right? So if demand and supply are not shifting for any reason, the price will hold steady at P star and quantity will hold steady at Q star as well. Use the cheat sheet to determine the effects on equilibrium price and quantity when one or both curves shift. Here's a fun hint. If both demand and supply are shifting, one of the two, P star or Q star, will be ambiguous, but never both, right? It can't be. But uh, if both are shifting, doesn't matter if both are increasing, both are decreasing, one's going up or one's going down. One of those uh, values, equilibrium price or equilibrium quantity, one of them will be ambiguous. Use the cheat sheet, right, and matching arrows to find out which one is which. So with that, Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you got anything out of this video, please like and or subscribe. If you have any questions or comments or want uh, to suggest something that I talk about next, let me know and I'll see you next time.